Good morning, folks. We're just gonna wait a few minutes before we begin, um, settle in, get comfortable, and we'll let everybody log in. like we're still gaining a few folks. Give it one more minute and then we will start our assembly. Happy Friday. Okay. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today virtually, um, students, faculty, staff, alumni, parents who are joining us. Um, before we begin, let's start with a moment of silence. Good morning again. Um, I'm thrilled to have you all here with us. Um, I want to share with you a roadmap of our lecture today. Um, after introductions, our speaker Kristen will deliver her talk. Um, during the talk, um, you are encouraged to type questions into the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. Um, we'll use these questions after Kristen is finished speaking um, to do a live moderated Q&A. Um, at the conclusion of her talk. Um, and then we will conclude our assembly at 925. Um, so welcome to the 2020 Abigail Rebecca Cohen lecture. The GFS art department is privileged to bring the very first, as far as I know, totally virtual <laughs> Cohen art lecture to the GFS community. The Cohen Art Lecture was created in memory of Abigail Rebecca Cohen, a 1991 GFS graduate. Her life as an artist and photographer was dedicated to the pursuit of social and aesthetic concerns. The Cohen Art Lecture is made possible by the generous support of Abigail's brother, Jonathan Cohen, class of 88, and his wife, Julia Pershawn. The Cohen Art Lecture reflects GFS's Quaker philosophy that guides students to understand and appreciate their world through inquiry and artistic expression. At this time of remote learning and deep reflection, we're especially grateful to the Cohen family for supporting this lecture as an opportunity to deepen our community's appreciation of art as a tool to better understand and imagine our experiences as humans in this world. I'll now turn things over to um, senior studio artist, <laughs> Julia St. Amour, who will do the honors of introducing our speaker. So GFS is thrilled to welcome Kristen Neville Taylor as our 2020 Abigail Cohen art lecturer. Uh, Kristen is a Philadelphia based artist and curator whose work investigates humans perception of nature. Kristen creates immersive installation based environments that include drawing, sculpture and glass. Her art is a visual form of research that asks its viewers to consider our habits and actions and their effect on the world around us. Uh, Kristen holds an MFA from Tyler School of Art and is the co-founder of the gallery and artist collaborative Little Berlin. Her work has been shown locally at Vox Populi, the Woodmere Art Museum, and the Philadelphia Art Alliance, and nationally at the Pacific Northwest College of Art, Richard Stockton College, Rowan University, and Expo Chicago. Taylor has organized several ex exhibitions, including Landscape Technique at Little Berlin and the Usable Earth at the Esther Klein Gallery. She is a recycled artist in, res in residence, a Vermont Studio Center Fellow, and the recipient of the Laurie Ragman Prize in Glass. So thank you so much for joining us, Kristen, and welcome to GFS, or at least virtual GFS. Thank you so much, Julia, for that lovely introduction. And uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm so glad that I'm able to be with you um, in spite of our unusual circumstances. 
um, maybe one time I'll be able to come visit you at your uh, campus in the future. Um, I want to say thank you to the Cohens and GFS for this opportunity and Megan for reaching out. Um, so I will uh, begin by sharing my screen with you so that um, uh, while I'm talking about my process, um, I can, um, you can follow along with some images. So let me do this. And I apologize in advance if I, my eyes look down, I'm using my phone for notes. Um, do. Okay, so hopefully everyone has the good view of that. Um, uh, so my name is Kristen Neville Taylor. I'm an artist, educator, and curator living in Philadelphia, uh, where I've uh, lived all of my life. So um, as you'll see, Philadelphia and its surroundings often inform my practice. I use art as a tool for asking questions, often about nature, and the systems and events that shape our, how we understand it. As a result, a lot of my work tends to be environmental, but as I'll show today, it encompasses lots of other topics and concerns, none of which are unrelated. I'll share my history now as an artist and curator to help you understand what has shaped my most urgent and important ideas to date. This photograph we're looking at now was taken a few years ago in front of my husband's wood shop in West Philadelphia, where we live. I had for so long wanted to make a solar uh, project using solar power. And this is the moment when I've successfully tested my solar equipment for the first time. And I was really excited. Um, so my background in training is in glass making. Um, I was first introduced to glass when I was around your age. Uh, I was 16 and a friend I had met at a drawing workshop at Moore College in Center City uh, had helped me get an internship at a local public access glass blowing studio which unfortunately is no longer around. Um, I was drawn to glass because it was so unfamiliar and I was curious about its unique ability to transform from liquid to solid in plain sight. My high school art teacher would even let me experiment with glass in the ceramics kiln, but neither of us knew enough and everything kept breaking due to what I now understand as incompatibility. Here I am working with a large team to make a big amphora vase inside of a plaster mold that I made. The team element of glass definitely drew it to me, uh, drew me to the material in the beginning. And it's uh, help doesn't hurt that it's pretty uh, magical. Uh, there's even more people outside of the frame. It's um, amazing how many people will work on just um, one object together. So after high school, I attended Tyler School of Art in Philadelphia. Um, I knew that it was a good school, that it was affordable, and that it had a glass program. So those are my teenage, that was the teenage criteria for school for me. Um, at the time, I was very interested in science and its display and had fertile ground here in Philadelphia with places such as the Mütter Museum. Maybe you visited with a field trip or a family. Um, and this image is taken from their skull collection. Um, in school, I learned that I tend to thrive in a learning environment. I love research and being surrounded by resources, expert makers, deep thinkers, and the library. Um, so after graduating from art school, I started a gallery uh, called Little Berlin with some friends. We operated as a collective, meaning we shared all the responsibilities for paying for the rent, cleaning up and maintaining the space and organizing art shows. We wanted to create a space together that served as a platform for artists, performers, thinkers, and all types of creators in the city. We were responding at the time to other longstanding organizations such as Vox Populi Gallery and Space 1026 that had created their own culture through art and programming. Okay. Um, so um, I learned a lot at Little Berlin. Um, unlike other collective gallery models, we founded Little, Little Berlin on a curatorial model. Um, curating was not something I fully understood until I did it myself. I didn't really learn about it in school. Um, essentially, as a curator of an art exhibition, you envision an idea for a show, you invite artists to participate, and most importantly, you support artists in installation and display of their work. Curating was and still is a way for me to gather artists and artworks together that address questions that I have in my own art practice. It's a productive and exciting way to learn directly from other people who are engaged with similar ideas as you. Um, this image above is from an exhibition I organized called Landscape Technique that looked at the ways that artists represent the natural world based um, on the influence of new technologies. Uh, I'm a materials-based artist, meaning that my practice is not limited to one medium or discipline. 
I make creative decisions based on where materials come from, their physical composition, and their social, political, and environmental history. Beyond traditional art materials like paint, ceramics, and glass, I use household materials like aluminum foil and sugar. Using common materials allows me to collapse the divide between art and everyday life. This photo was taken on a field trip to the University of Pennsylvania Materials Library. I teach a graduate course at Moore College each fall about materials. And here my student is holding something called precision silica aerogel sphere, which is really photogenic and makes a strange sound when you drop it on a hard surface. Okay. So uh, now I want to move into talking about some of my recent work. My art continues to be influenced by the limits and capacity of science and technology and the systems and events that shape our perception of nature. I'm gonna play you a short video clip now from a film by Donna Haraway, who has and continues to be an influential figure in my practice. So hopefully this will work for everyone. And let's take culture apart like these balls of yarn. First, I'd like to explain the principle that I use in looking at the production of modern culture. Seems to me the cultural critic is faced by a world that looks very much like tangled balls of yarn. And that one way to approach the situation is to pull on a thread and begin to untangle the ball of meanings and begin to trace through one thread and then another what gets to count as nature, for whom and when, and how much it costs to produce nature at a particular moment in history for a particular group of people. What gets to count as nature, for whom and when, and how much it costs to produce nature at a particular moment in history for a particular group of people. Okay, so I, I really recommend watching the whole video. It's called Donna Haraway Reads the National Geographic on Primates. It's really campy, but fun um, and smart. Um, I love Haraway's metaphor of the tangled ball of yarn, and I like to keep that in the back of my mind whenever I choose a topic or question to make work about. I think it's a great way to trace material history and cultural, cultural history backwards. So I live in Palatine Village in West Philadelphia with my husband, which is also where he grew up and his parents still live. Palatine has a rich history and served as an enclave for diverse group of organizers, activists, and people generally seeking alternative lifestyles in the 60s and 70s. This is a photo of my mother-in-law from that time. I was influenced by their rich history and the stories that came from raising a family there. The early environmental movement has a deep connection to Philadelphia and I began to sort through family ephemera as well as public collections such as Temple University's digital archives. The first Earth Week happened in Philadelphia in Fairmount Park 50 years ago this month. This is the Earth Week cover from the Daily Philadelphian found in Temple's archives. Uh, my in-laws helped me a lot with my research by letting me pull from their personal stuff. I used their copy of the Whole Earth Catalog to develop ideas for artworks, and also to help me dictate a system of display. The Whole Earth Catalog was created by a man named Stuart Brand and was an early DIY crowdsourced countercultural magazine that included everything from recipes to tutorials, artwork, um, lots, of, lots of different things. Um, and it's considered by many to be a precursor to the internet and search engines of today. So, um, I had actually left Little Berlin Gallery and became a member of uh, another collective I mentioned, Vox Populi. I participated in my first group show there with work that I made about that early environmental movement. So this is an installation shot of that work. So this is the photograph of my mother-in-law again. Here it's been printed on linen and it's wrapped around a wooden frame that's meant to re represent like maybe an abstraction of a book. Um, and adjacent to that is some embroidery. Um, the full quote that the embroidery references um, is a quote by Stuart Brand, which reads, help save the world, do something wrong today. I was thinking about the um, early idealism of my mother and father-in-law as young adults and how we lose sight of those things as we grow older and become creatures of comfort. Um, this piece is called Pink Prose, and it's meant to allude to both the seduction and aggressive nature of consumerism. A lot of people criticize the Whole Earth Catalog for um, reading a particular type of consumer culture. There's a lot of things for sale in the magazine, um, and L.L. Bean was an early product 
of the counterculture movement, um, but today is considered consumptive and market driven. So I was thinking of like neat displays in clothing stores um, and um, actually worked at one as a teenager and it was kind of a brutal task to keep everything neat and tidy. Um, but here um, I soaked each t-shirt in candy and, and folded it and once it had hardened, I cut it on the bandsaw in an attempt to make a perfect cube. Um, this piece is called uh, Water in the Service of Man which was a book advertised for sale in the copy of, um, my, of my copy of the Whole Earth Catalog. I think of it as a work of art in of itself, um, but I also wanted to connect this image of the ancient Roman aqueducts with contemporary construction practice, so I spackled it directly to the wall. So around this time, I also started to make sculptures in the same way you might make a flower arrangement but in place of flowers, I was using objects and images from all different types of sources, from my personal collection, public archives, and then other made and found objects. I would start by first gathering materials and creating a kind of library that related to a question or subject, and then I would begin to make relationships through composition. Here's a detail. The blown glass object on the left was made by me, and the small sculpture on the right was made by my father-in-law when he was my age. This piece is also thinking about inheritance of both physical stuff, but also ideologies. So um, this piece is marbling paper that I make that's been applied to a wood frame. And it's meant to reference like a sample board for something that might be for sale, um, but also the marbling um, found on the insides of books. And so this is made by creating sometimes for larger sheets, a custom pool of water um, and then burning acetylene on the surface to create carbon, to create pure carbon. Then I use the paper to lift up the carbon and make a print. Um, so uh, for my exhibition called Works and Days, uh, Hesiod's Ancient Almanac of the same name was the framework or the motivation to explore uh, ecological and political events, as well as everyday um, conduct that characterized life in ancient uh, Greece and Philadelphia, and present-day Philadelphia. Uh, like the whole Earth Catalog, I used the structure of an almanac, which would include everything from long-range weather forecasts to poetry and entertainment as an organizing device. Uh, Hesiod's work was often criticized for being small-minded and too set within his lo own local landscape, especially in comparison to something like Homer's uh, broad canvas in the Iliad. So I definitely uh, relate to Hesiod as someone who's only lived in and made work uh, about Philadelphia, but I also find inspiration in Hesiod's ability to ask bigger questions and make them relatable through a localized setting and personal experience. Okay, so this is an installation shot of works and days. In the center of the installation was an observatory platform, is what I called it, um, that included some fortune tellers, like maybe you call them cootie catchers, um, and also a newspaper that I made. And then on the outside of the platform was a series of drawings, sculptures, and glass castings. Sorry, I'm a little sniffly. Um, so this is the inside of the newspaper. Um, it's like the digital file that was printed. Uh, it included essays um, and ads, both real and fake, and a list of imaginary worlds from books and movies. And it served as kind of a guide for um, um, contextualizing the work in the room. So this vase um, was made using that large plaster mold with the big team at the beginning of the slideshow. Um, it includes some sharpie, drawing, sharpie drawings on the exterior, um, and I call it Allegory of the Schuylkill, after Aikens, after Rush. And I made it in homage to Philadelphia artists William Rush and Thomas Aikens. Um, who both portrayed the Schuylkill River as male and female gods. If you go to the waterworks, or maybe you've seen it, um, their, their statues are there, and there's paintings and drawings as well. Um, and, but here I wanted to like subvert the um, personification of nature, and so instead I have this character that I made um, based on the mascot, mascot for my dad's local union, and so it becomes the river god. Okay, so this is a fountain made out of coolers. I collect coolers because they're a common accessory of workers in Philadelphia, including my father. 
the, the water moves from the bottom to the top and streams slowly down like the cooler's like sweating or crying. Um, I call it labor to leisure. This is a large glass casting made with a process called uh, pativer, which was used in, antiqu in, in antiquity uh, to uh, imitate precious stones to fool and impress the elite. The pattern here is modeled after a climate map. Oh, sorry. Uh, this is another installation view of works and days. This wall in the corner, it might be on your right side, it's on my left side, um, couldn't be screwed to the floor, floor, so I needed a creative solution to keep it from falling over. Um, so sometimes my artwork is uh, dictated by these, these kinds of problems. Um, with the help of friends, I borrowed as many books as I could from the library to use as weights. So each person was give, given a list of five or six books based on research for the exhibition, but then they could browse and borrow other titles that they thought might relate or connect or support the show. Um, so you can see some books on science fiction, geological time, and almanacs, for example. And then I organized the books horizontally like the strata of rock, which I feel like a librarian might not approve. Um, in 2017, I had the opportunity to participate in the residency at RARE, which stands for Recycled Artist in Residency. Um, it takes place at a recycling center in Philadelphia. This is one of the piles. Um, so it was easily one of my favorite experiences. Here I am in my RARE uniform, taking a bathroom selfie. Okay. Here is some of my rare flair, uh, which I collected from the trash. Each day, staff at Rare will help you pick through the trash from construction sites and estate sales that's dumped daily. I worked on several projects while I was there. Um, I was really drawn to highly technical fabrics, uh, and I started to make quilts out of this insulation material. Uh, here is a shot of a larger quilt that I made in progress. Um, I also became really fascinated with the role of water in the recycling process. I had no idea how much water was used every day just to keep the dust, the incessant dust down. Um, and it would collect behind the piles in this like swampy mess. Um, so I started to try to filter this swampy water with materials that I collected in the trash. As you can imagine, people throw everything out, everything you need to make a custom water filter, including, including grass seed. But the main reason that I was there, uh, what I had pro proposed to do was to expand a series of sculptures that I call pre-modern pulverizing, where I take everyday objects, assuming that one day after like say a major event, they'll become a future artifact, and I pulverize them and I turn them into balls so that I can strip them of any of their identifying characteristics, um, strip them of their history and allow them to defy categories. Okay. Um, here's a sampler. I don't usually tell people what they are because that kind of defeats the purpose. Um, but this is an inside scoop in my studio of some of the things that I would shred. Um, you can see there's a whole earth catalog, tennis shoes, sunglasses, and a cooking pot, for example. Maybe uh, you can see the Donna Summer record. Um, this is me in my studio with the Ninja, blend, uh, Ninja Blender that I use to shred things. Um, so. Um, but at Rare, I got to really scale up and use this huge shredder. Um, so I'm just going to play you a short video. So every Saturday at one o'clock, the Rare staff would help me um, operate the machine. Oh. <laughs> So it produced so much material. I wasn't even really prepared for how much material um, each object would produce. And so I wasn't able to make the balls by hand like a snowball like I formerly would. And so I had to make molds. So I used materials collected in the trash like a yoga ball and concrete with the one mold. And then the other mold is actually just the underside of a Weber grill. And I would make them in halves and then glue them and ratchet strap them together. So this is the finished uh, park bench. Um, and it's just 
the park bench in glue. Um, I also had the opportunity to show some of the work that I made during the residency for a show at Vox Populi. I called the show uh, Signals Catch and Release after the term used in recreational fishing to describe a method of capturing, assessing, and releasing fish back to the water. But here I was releasing images and objects back to the world. I made a piece, um, is this in the way? I knew that. Um, I made a piece called After Nature based on the recent findings by MIT researchers that discovered it was possible to clean water using the sapwoods, um, uh, the xylem shaped filter of sapwoods like pine and cedar. Um, so the work has a pragmatic function um, to just show how um, simple materials can create access to clean water and also um, a metaphorical function. Um, uh, the branch is shaped like a divining rod, which is um, considered um, to be able to help one find water on land. Okay, so I used the shredder to uh, pulverize a corporate office desk that still had all the files and pens and notes um, inside. Um, it had a stereo and speakers that I found in the dump, which played uh, weather music tuned to 528 hertz, um, which is a frequency that a man named uh, John Hutchinson claims to have cleaned the water after the BP oil spill with. Um, so I'll just leave that there. The stereo is powered by the solar panel we saw in the first slide. Um, and then inside the debris tower sit materials normally reserved for a natural history museum like coral and fossils and a common pheasant, um, all found in the trash at rare. And then here I just wanted to show this install shot. You can see the solar panel fit into the window and hinged like a um, window shade. Okay, so um, following that I had a show at Fleischer Art Memorial in South Philadelphia where I revisited Mary Shelley's Frankenstein through an environmental lens. I split the room into two halves. One side featured glow in the dark glass to re represent a kind of fantasy of nature. And the light side featured silver foil and clear glass and was modeled after a laboratory for reflecting on the future. So the centerpiece in the dark, on the dark side was an archway of glass daisies called Portal. And it represents the passage between the world as Victor Frankenstein knew it and the new world that he called into being when he brought the creature back to life. It's meant to resemble a wedding arbor to reflect the complicated relationship between humans and nature, and also the ways in which we perpetuate this fantasy of nature through stories. So all of the work that glows is made out of glass through various glass making processes. This is a detailed view of Portal. Um, and on the back wall of the installation is a series of cast glass objects called souvenirs of a marriage and each serves as a symbol of the ways that media and culture influence definitions of nature. So like the alarm clock ref references the invention of mechanical time and its role in shifting the ways we experience the natural world. And then in the Donna Haraway film from earlier, she later mentions how G National Geographic was the top magazine gifted to newlyweds in the 80s. And my parents were one of those couples and had old subscriptions stuffed in one closet in our house um, and these magazines have shaped so much of what I understand about nature today. All of these glass objects are made using the same lost wax casting process. So I first make a rubber mold of the original object, in this case, a ceramic lion from eBay. And then I pour casting wax into the rubber mold. And this is a different object, but the next step. Um, and then, um, uh, we actually you coat, start to coat the wax object with plaster and silica, which is the mold material used for glass castings. The secret ingredient in the background is Aquanet hairspray, which allows the material to stick to the slippery wax. And then you keep building the layers up, adding fiberglass between to strengthen the mold for the kiln. This is an image of my mold making class that I teach each fall at Tyler, working together on a large collaborative mold. Once the mold has set, we use a steamer like one steam for steaming clothes or curtains to gently melt the wax out of the mold. And then you have an empty cavity uh, where the original line once was that you can fill with glass and it's fired in a kiln to 1500 degrees. This is a glass tablet created using a similar process um, using glow in the dark glass, though it's just a bit more elaborate. It's created by painting in reverse inside a mold with glass pastes, which is the pate verre technique that I mentioned earlier. 
Um, I often describe it as like glazing ceramics except in reverse. So this is um, the step-by-step. -step. First you mix glass powders um, with Elmer's glue and water to make it uh, move uh, more like paint, although it's more like honey, it's like sluggish. And then you work um, backwards as if you were, um, uh, so if you were painting an eye, you'd first paint the pupil, then the iris, then the white of the eye. And then it gets a little bit easier. You can stand to be less precise as you color in the background. And then finally the mold goes in the kiln and is fired again to 1500 degrees. And then this is the finished product, um, which is uh, without the UV light, this is what it looks like. Um, and this glass is um, less transparent. Um, it looks like a lot more like stone than what blown glass looks very clear. So the following summer, I had a, this would be 2018. I had a short residency at the Schuylkill Center for Environmental Education, which also has an art gallery and program. They called the show Wet Lab and they invited artists to come and show and make work about water. So I was interested in asking the question, what makes water visible? And I used my time to interview experts such as uh, Doug Gerald Max, shown here, um, who was a geophysicist at UPenn. Um, I, inter I interviewed Doug in West Philly, and then um, I went uh, tagged along with him and some roboticists in the Wissahickon to observe as they developed a project together. Um, I also interviewed Adam Levine, who's the historian for the Philadelphia Water Department. And he took me and some other folks on a tour of the former reservoir in Roxboro and showed me places where small streams and rivers original to Philadelphia had been buried. I organized a tour of, for a group of like-minded folks to visit the water treatment plant. Um, this residency did not produce any new work yet, um, but sometimes things move slowly and um, that was the case for this. Um, but what did happen for me during this time was that um, I was reminded of my history of collaboration with groups like Little Berlin and Vox Populi, and this experience really galvanized my commitment to working with and learning from others. So my next project and re most recent project was highly collaborative. Um, with my friend Ricky Giannis, we put together a symposium and exhibition about solar power and its technical and narrative potential. We called the show and symposium The Green Sun, and it was um, this, the, the title borrows from a quote uh, by Tolkien that asks what it takes to build a world that is believable outside of our own. And this photo is from a workshop presented at the symposium that described how our energy grid works. So Ricky and I really see art as a background to the larger questions and ideas we wanna share with ourselves, our friends and our community. Um, and so we were able to use the gallery to host different school groups and to continue the conversation about solar energy and the power of the imagination. So I created an artwork for the show uh, for the Green Sun called They Told Us Earth Was Mother, but it is in fact the sun. I was curious about the role of time in human lives, still am, and how capitalism challenges environmental progress. I reinterpreted a timekeeping device uh, created by Athanasius Kircher at a moment just before the invention of mechanical time. So it was really romanticizing um, pre-mechanical time. His invention uses sunflowers and water that follow the sun's position in the sky. So the title also references the tendency to call Earth mother, which has negative implications, like thinking that your mother will come clean up after your mess. I like thinking about the sun as mother also, as life-giving but also punishing. So this is an image of Athanasius Kircher's flower clock design. And just before the quarantine, I had been working on a new piece that was related to this, um, this uh, series. This is the, the part of the work in progress. And these pieces are made using uh, glass rods that are prefabricated and very small torch powered by oxygen and propane gas. But more recently, really recently, as a new mother and a materials-based artist, I find myself at a crossroads in my work as I'm confronted with my own research on um, nature and the environment. Um, so as I look to temper my relationship to material production, I've started to ask myself this question, what must necessarily be made material? And since I don't know the answer yet, I decided to just write it outside and kind of send it off into the universe. So um, I took my trusty crew, my husband and daughter, and my laser cut stencil to a place on the Schuylkill River a place I would go as a teenager to step outside of reality and dream about the world. So it seemed a good place to ask this question. 
And that's um, just, just kind of abbreviated um, journey to take you where I am today. Um, and so now I'd love to know if you have any questions or comments and um, we could take it from there. So maybe I'll stop my screen share. And do that. All right, excellent. Thank you so much, Kristen. Um, okay, let me share, yeah. Yeah, so um, folks, we have, if you have questions, go ahead and type them into that Q&A. If you go to the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little menu and there's a, a place where you can go ahead and um, type in questions. And so um, our first question for you, Kristen, is um, from a student and it is in your creation process, does the question you want to answer always come before the concept for the piece? No. <laughs> um, I think that, um, that there's a kind of um, juggling act where you're, where I am, uh, you know, reading and thinking through ideas. Um, and sometimes um, I'll be reading like a, a science fiction book and I won't be, I won't necessarily expect that it will become material for a new um, idea or artwork. Um, so um, yeah, I think, and then because I'm drawing from uh, life and personal experience, um, I'm also often surprised by what I am motivated to make work about. And I'll also just say that um, I, I like materials and I like to experiment. So sometimes I'll be just, I'll just want to play around or try something that I've never done before. Um, and that becomes material um, that kind of just like later might, might manifest something that might surprise me. Um, so along those lines, um, can you describe the role of research in your, in your artistic process? Um, I think it gives me um, a lot of fuel um, to, um, and I think that it, 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 I think of it more now um, as like, um, I don't know that you can call it collaborative when you're empowered by other people's ideas, but it certainly feels like um, I'm sharing in um, um, some kind of like um, idea pot or something when I'm reading um, texts that uh, I share with friends or, or when there's like a, a community of thinkers that are, are trying to like solve certain problems. Um, so um, I think it's a way for me to stay connected to how other people are uh, examining um, issues and ideas about the world. Um, but also it just gives me um, um, like a fuel in the studio to experiment and try things out and think about how I can visualize ideas. I don't know if that That's answers. great. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, here's another question. Um, someone would love to know who some of your inspirations are from the art world. From the art world? Um, well, I always resist saying this, but I feel like I'm so much like Mark Dion, but um, I, don't, I don't think of him as like a favorite artist, but I feel an affinity to Mark Dion. But I also really like, um, uh, I got to see the Agnes Denny's show in New York recently, and um, Eve Laramie is also a really um, amazing artist. And they're all kind of looking at um, science and nature and technology. So those are some of the few people. Um, some younger artists that I really like are Two Greenfort. Um, I wish everything he made, I wish I had made. Um, and uh, Camille Onro. So I really like um, those are a few people. Great. Thank you. All right. Here's a couple more. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the process when the glass comes out of the kiln? How long does it take to cool off after being at such a high temperature? How fragile is the work at, the, at that stage? How does that fit into your artistic process? Oh, yeah. Um, um, I don't, I haven't made any work recently that's really um, uh, like taking advantage of those qualities of glass that it's a fragile. Because honestly, I think when you become really in, um, engaged with the material, you realize it can be really strong and that some of these things, um, these ideas that we have that it's fragile because it can break are, um, don't always hold up. Um, and so when I'm making glass castings, I'll just lug them around like it's like 
no big deal. Um, but as far as the temperature goes, um, the way that we do it, because anytime you introduce heat to glass, you're basically introducing stress. And so when, we, um, when we're done firing the kiln, um, we have to bring it down really slowly. So we, unlike ceramics, we have what's called an annealing cycle, and it comes down really slowly through stress and strain points that have been provided to us. We're very lucky um, in this day and age by uh, manufacturers of the glass that we use. Um, so it's like a specific scientific formula. Um, and then you never want to bring it out um, when it, unless until it's like totally at room temperature, because if you've ever put glasses in a dishwasher and then taken them out and it's really hot and then you run it underwater, that um, heat that can cause like um, uh, stress from the heat. Okay, really interesting. Um, here is another one. Um, hold on, sorry. Um, you have so many larger pieces and employ sort of bulk heavy materials. Um, what happens to those pieces when the installation is dismantled? That's a really good question and also why I'm really interested in looking at different models of making. Um, because I don't sell artwork, uh, that's just my reality. Um, I don't really expect that to change. Um, but um, I have like the silver quilt just like rolled up in a ball, I can see it in front of me and everything collapses down. Um, I try my best if I make like a, pl a plinth or pedestal or something that's built out of like materials that are useful again, to um, not use glue, to use things that, that it could be easily collapsed and reused later. So um, I try to think of things ahead of time because um, throwing things out. I'd like to reuse things and I'll, you, maybe even in images you saw things come back and forth between different shows. So I try to, sometimes I'll just take something off the shelf in my house and then it just goes back there for an installation too. So it, um, it all it depends. Okay, great. Um, so what were some of your interests when you were in high school and which of those have sort of endured and become part of your your practice as an artist? I mean, I don't really think <laughs> too much of who I was. Um, I definitely had a curiosity about, um, um, uh, you know, reading about uh, nature. I had like started an environmental club as like an elementary school student. And though some of those things persisted, but I don't think at the time that I drew the connection that that could be something that would inform an artwork. Um, so I think some of those things persisted for sure. And, and when did you, when do you think you started to consider yourself an artist? I mean, I think I always was pretty, um, I always thought of myself as an artist, though I think it's sometimes hard for ourselves to say that out loud. So I think I always thought of myself as an artist, um, but as I learned more about what it, meant professionally. I was always resistant to saying it, but I think the sooner you say it, the better. The sooner you say it to yourself, the better. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so someone asked you about your influences and in the art world, and I'm wondering who are your greatest influencers as thinkers? Um, well, certainly, like I mentioned, uh, Donna Haraway um, is pretty influential. Um, for a long time. Um, and let me think of who else. Um, I really like the anthropologist um, Severin Bold, who teaches in New York, him or something. Um, but his writing and thinking about material culture and history has been really um, informative in my practice. Great. Um, here's a question that just came in. Um, can you talk more about the piece that utilized the library books to weigh the installation? Sure. Um, that was, well, the way that I organized that show, um, I was thinking of it um, as kind of like um, an evolution of life. So it began as like creation and then um, his, there was like a, a shelving unit dedicated to history. And then that one came, sort of came around and was like kind of like thinking about like knowledge production. So I like thinking about these books as kind of like the strata or the foundation of ideas. Um, and also it wasn't, what I love, why I, I thought of it as an interesting anecdote, anecdote to share was that it was something that was unplanned. 
um, and the development of that exhibition that came together um, kind of as needed. Um, but still something that um, I think sometimes those ideas that we have to come up with on the fly are really kind of honest and um, I don't know. Um, um, I don't know if that answers the question about that piece, but um, and on the ups, um, I had also created this book that was like the cross section um, of a sculpture that I had cut in half and um, it was kind of like the strata of a rock on the top. So there was all these other objects that informed that that side of the room. And so if, thinking of what you're just saying, what, like, how would you describe sort of the, the percentage of planning versus um, like intuitive doing um, goes into making one of those sort of immersive environments? Um, I, th I think that um, what I, I really like to do is um, have a really strong plan, like uh, something that I think I'll follow. And I'll, I love, I'll just draw that gallery space over and over again with the objects and move things around and try to, try to predict the way um, things might, um, what relationships might happen with things beside one another. Um, and then you always just have to be flexible when you go into the space, um, even the large quilt, there had been a fire in the gallery and I kept drawing this, the show over and over again. The, the quilt fit perfectly in that wall and I forgot that there was heating pipes that ran through the top and I had to cut around four pipes to fit through the piece. Um, and so it was like this kind of challenge um, to make that decision. Should I not hang it there? Should I work with what's there? Um, how would that change the work? So I think I make, I make really strict plans and then I try to be flexible. I actually, my favorite part of art is not like showing it or the opening, but installing the work in the space. I would just, I want that to go on and on and on, <laughs> but it only lasts a couple days. So. Great. Um, so you um, talked about one of your pieces having to do with the idealism of youth. Um, and so I'm just wondering if you, like sort of what productive idealism do you see in young people right now that, you know, as someone, um, as you get older, you hope to sort of hold on to or emulate or you are looking up to at this point? I mean, I, I feel like I, it doesn't, I can remember and um, I can see it now in a lot of youth movements and groups that um, it's just inherent in you that you can, you can see the world outside of the world that exists. You can imagine things um, and believe that it would be possible. And you can see the steps, and I shouldn't be saying you, but I, I believe that young people can see the steps necessary to get there and that adults are just in the way. And so um, I kind of liked making that piece, like do something wrong today to remind myself and maybe other people, like don't forget, because um, wrong isn't always bad. It just sometimes resists the status quo. Great. Great. Um, and then, um, you know, really thinking about uh, where we are now, you know, the two of us in our own homes, um, so much of our lives are really being dominated by um, a, a force of nature. And I'm wondering, um, as an artist, what are you thinking about? Um, you know, are there ideas that are starting to per percolate as your home with your family? I mean, certainly I, I think that the most important thing is um, just like taking care of ourselves now. So that's what's been on my mind the most and to actually like slow things down a bit and not be so um, um, concerned about like the next thing you're going to make or the next gallery show you're going to have, but to take this as an opportunity to um, reflect and um, like I think it's making it a little bit easier maybe for um, um, people, uh, unlike young people who to actually see like that the world could be different, that like the world, um, we don't need a pandemic to tell us that the air could be clean, um, that kind of thing. Um, and so I'm definitely, um, I'm for, I don't know if I should say this out loud, but I'm like, I just want to drop out of society and have a permacultural garden and move out of the city. So those are some of my thoughts. But um, again, I'm just trying to take it one day at a time and um, listen and like um, honor those thoughts. Um, and so yeah, I think certainly like 
the things that we always thought we could rely on all of the i mean i don't have to say this out loud everyone knows but the all the inequity inequities all these things that are being laid bare are um uh, definitely making me rethink things and um, i've been writing a lot about um what i might change in my practice for an application and it's really it's actually making me feel really motivated to do things like i said to use less materials to think in more of like a propositional way great great thank you so much um kristen we are there any last questions before we we wrap up and give people one more one more shot here um we're starting to get to the end of our our time here um Kristen, thank you so much for being with us and um, just a really timely and wonderful look into your work. And thank you everybody who joined us this morning. Um, it was a real pleasure to be able to um, spend some time thinking about um, how um, creative work can move us forward as humans. Um, and Kristen, I do really hope that once we're back on campus, um, you'll come visit us and, and have a chance to be with some of the students. Thank you, Megan. Yeah, I would love to come out and see what you're all working on, thinking about. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank all right, you. GFS, have a great Friday and a wonderful weekend. And um, happy holidays to everybody. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye.